This is Unwind Your Mind Back to God, written by David Hofmeister and read by Tarana Singh. In today's episode, we continue unlearning the world with Book 2. In Chapter 7, this is Section 4, Part 2 of 5, Going Deep with the Early Lessons, 2 of 5. The key is the atonement. Atonement was built into the whole time-space continuum or the whole thought of separation. The atonement put an end, a limit on the mind's ability to miscreate. It can seem as if there is an infringement on free will, but it is kind to have that built in. Jesus says it would not be kind to let you go on and on and on and have to choose from every option. Talk about taking a long, long time. It is precious when you can start to generalize the transfer of training from a trip to Hawaii or switching around relationships or all the different things that are attempted. When seekers come together and start sharing their stories, even though the forms vary, they are all really the same in terms of the underlying content. Ah, we have all been seeking in the wrong place. Even though the forms of our seeking have varied, we see very clearly that this is not the way. There is no rest in being a seeker. The only rest comes from being a finder. That is the experience we are pointing to. It is not good enough to work your way to the edge of the cliff. The only reason you got to the edge was to jump. There is no rest in being at the edge of the cliff because even though it seems like there there has been quite a progression in getting there, there is no release aside from jumping. In a sense, you could say that to try to pierce the veil and just go directly into the light without having questioned the darkness is kind of like a bungee jump. You go into the light and then you seem to get hurled back. It is very disorienting. It is not satisfying because you have a burning yearning to return and yet there is still a fear of it. There are many things that are still unquestioned. That is why the mind has to stay with what is to let go into the water or to let go into the light. Okay, we are up to lesson number 10. Now let us recap a bit. The workbook starts off with Nothing I see means anything. I have given what I see all the meaning it has for me. I do not understand anything I see. Three different lessons to start off on the topic of perception. Not only does it not mean anything, it is not even understandable. The reason is that everything in the world is entirely subjective. Or, you could say, seen entirely from the ego's perspective. The subject in that sense is subjective. It is the ego, which really has no meaning at all. Therefore, nothing I see means anything, and I do not understand anything I see. Lesson 4 does not yet make the overt connection 
that thoughts produce the perceptions. It just introduces the idea that your thoughts do not mean anything. Lesson 5 continues with, I am never upset for the reason I think. Once thinking has been introduced, upset comes into the picture. Lesson 6. I am upset because I see what is not there. The upset is being related to hallucination or seeing a world that does not exist. Then, in lesson number 7, we have our first lesson in time. I see only the past. We jump from I am upset because I see what is not there to I see only the past. What is not there is the past. There is a connection between those two. My mind is preoccupied with past thoughts. The idea of time or past is associated with the thoughts that are first brought up in Lesson 4. I see nothing as it is now. It is foreshadowing the idea that the holy instant and the world do not have anything to do with each other. The holy instant is non-perceptual. The holy instant is revelatory and therefore I see nothing as it is now. My thoughts do not mean anything. That is lesson number 10. My thoughts do not mean anything. I have no private thoughts. Yet, it is only private thoughts of which I am aware. What can these thoughts mean? They do not exist and so they mean nothing. Yet my mind is part of creation and part of its creator. Would I not rather join the thinking of the universe than to obscure all that is really mine with my pitiful and meaningless private thoughts? Workbook Lesson 52, Para 5, Review of Lesson 10 It could be said in general that people often feel that their lives seem meaningless, that they run around doing a lot of stuff, feeling out of control, feeling helpless, feeling like they are part of a larger system from which they cannot escape. And that is just the doing, the feeling that the actions of life seem meaningless. Why am I going to work? Why am I doing the same task over and over? Why am I cutting my lawn for the 979th time? Why am I polishing the silverware? Why am I doing this oil change? Why am I stacking the wood? Why do I keep repeating these same things? What is the purpose of all these repetitive actions that seem like toil at times? And those are just the actions. This lesson is saying, my thoughts do not mean anything. Meaning all the trains of thoughts that just seem to roll through the mind over and over. It is not only that all the physical actions do not mean anything, but the thoughts that rumble through the mind do not mean anything either. The thoughts are perceived by the deceived mind as what it is. It is identified with those thoughts. The basic ego belief is that the truth is different for everyone. To each his own. That is ludicrous. It cannot be so. 
It cannot be the reality. To each his own? You could use to each his own as a metaphor or stepping stone. To say each has his own experience and experience is non-transferable. But in the end, there is an experience that is universal and there is no individual in that experience. It is truly an impersonal experience. To each his own or the truth is different for everyone are basic ideas that have to be questioned. They represent the belief in private thoughts and private minds. Notice as we go along where the resistance comes up. Watch how tenaciously the deceived mind tries to protect the idea of private thoughts. Because if that goes, everything goes. Once the dam that is holding on to the idea of private thoughts breaks, then there is nothing that will hold the river back. We have learned about thoughts and we have learned about a world that does not mean anything and is not understandable. Now the connection is made in Lesson 11 that the thoughts are producing the world. The meaningless thoughts are producing the meaningless world. My meaningless thoughts are showing me a meaningless world. Since the thoughts of which I am aware do not mean anything, the world that pictures them can have no meaning. What is producing this world is insane and so is what it produces. Reality is not insane and I have real thoughts as well as insane ones. I can therefore see a real world if I look to my real thoughts as my guide for seeing. Workbook Lesson 53, Para 1, Review of Lesson 11 This sets the stage for ideas like Therefore, seek not to change the world, but choose to change your mind about the world. Text Chapter 21, Introduction Seek not to change the world, makes sense if my mind is producing the world. Of course I will have to change my mind if I want a significant change to take place. It is important to really open oneself to this idea. It cannot be just an intellectual idea where I continue to play the part of being a person. It is to see that those roles and that person and everything that seems to be happening is just a projection of meaningless thoughts. It cannot be both ways. That is why I call a lot of what seems to be going on a transitory phase. Because what is approaching as quickly as you want it to approach is a real devotional life. An inward life. A life that is perhaps best symbolized by monasteries and convents where you focus the mind on God. Only on the thought of God forgetting everything else. The image or metaphor that is coming is a priest without a parish, a monk without a monastery, a philosopher 
without a profession. End of part two of five of section four of chapter seven. We will continue with part three of five in tomorrow's episode.